I remember the first time I did this crossing on my way to Flanders and Ypres. It was at night in 1916. We crossed over from Southampton to Le Havre. I was only 21 and quite excited about it all. We were escorted by a large fleet of destroyers. On arrival, my first look at France was a woman selling long loaves of bread, which we eagerly bought. The war was still then, to me, a kind of adventure. And in a way, we were all rather looking forward to going to the front. But we didn't know then what scenes of unbelievable horror and desolation we were to see. Such a scene was at Passchendaele, one of the bloodiest battles of the war. Here, for as far as you could see, was a mass of shell holes, trenches, pools of mud, dead and dying men and horses. There was not a house or a tree left standing. Planted and rebuilt. Who would have known that 47,000 British and Commonwealth troops died here? Not to mention French, Belgian and of course the Germans. But yet the dead are not forgotten for standing on the ridge that they fought and died for is one of the largest British and Commonwealth cemeteries in the world. There are 12,000 graves and 35,000 names of those without graves inscribed on the walls. And when you think that each one of these stones marks the remains of a young man who, like me, had his own home, family, dreams and ambitions. And when you think that out of 700 men from our battalion who went into battle, only 30 came out. It makes you ask why, why? Probably the luckiest break for me was that I had been slightly wounded just before Passchendaele, so missed it, thank God. does a marvellous job in keeping these cemeteries in such wonderful condition. Arriving at Ypres for the first time in 52 years was something of a thrill. I just couldn't believe it. For when I was here last time, it was in ruins. There wasn't a building left whole. Most were flattened completely. I was in the Ypres district for about 18 months. I remember coming here for the first time. It was late at night as we marched up the main street, the ruins of the old cloth hall standing out against the moonlit sky. I was on my way up to the front for the first time. They have rebuilt the whole town completely as it was, restoring the old cloth hall to its former beauty. The 800 year old cathedral too was rebuilt. In fact, even more complete than before, for the spire was never completed on the original building. After the war, an English church was built, dedicated to St. George, which houses plaque and inscriptions to all the regiments that fought on the Ypres salient. One more reason for coming back to Ypres, or White as we all called it, was to find the grave of a very dear friend of mine, Sidney Nash, who was 60 on June 7, 1917. And as I could do nothing for him, I just picked up his Lewis gun and went on. And that was the last I saw of him. I didn't know where he was buried. The town of Ypres was once surrounded by ramparts and the one that remains was the only safe place during those days so this was why General Plumer had his headquarters inside. 
Not far along the road, out of Ypres to Lille, is railway dugouts where we could go to before and after doing a spell in the front line. In fact, I spent Christmas 1916 here. The land being so flat, you had to use whatever cover you could to dig your dugouts into. Almost opposite is Zillibeek Lake, where we used to throw bombs for practice. It's now a local beauty spot. My driver, Marcel, is himself a veteran of the First World War and still lives in Ypres. If there is a place that would bring the memories flooding back, it is here at Hill 60. It has been left just as it was at the Armistice, 1918. The only changes have been those made by nature. The story of Hill 60 was that it was held by the Germans, who from it could fire over a wide area and had almost complete command over the men in road and shelled it regularly both day and night. The only way to take it was to remove it so Australian and British engineers set about mining it right under the German noses. In fact, the Germans knew what was going on and tried to countermine, which resulted in heavy casualties for the engineers. But they succeeded. A little further away was Hill 62 and Sanctuary Wood, rather misnamed, defended mostly by the Canadians. As part of their memorial, they planted hundreds of maple trees along the avenue up to the top of the hill where the memorial itself stands. From here, you can see clearly the town of Yeep and see why it was fought for so bitterly. There is a museum, and also some of the trenches have been left. I spent many hours in trenches such as these, with the small dugouts, to get a little rest. I remember my first time in the trenches. We were going along them up to the front. There had been a cave-in, and we had to crawl underneath. There was a dead body in the way, which we had to crawl over. Not very pleasant. In the summer, it wasn't quite so bad, except for the smell and until you had to go over the top, you were probably a lot safer there than further back, for most of the shells went over the top. The winter, of course, was the worst, and when you had a lot of rain, the water in the trenches was up to your knees. Another notorious bloody spot was Hellfire Corner on the Menin Road, which was shelled and fired upon almost continuously. Another thrill for me was visiting Spoilbank Canal, for here we had dugouts we could come to for rest periods in reserve from the front line. As we were on the night that Hill 60 went up, I still haven't been able to find Sydney's grave. I thought it may have been here, but no luck. There are some 240 war cemeteries in Belgium, and a great many are in this area. We used to go to the town of Poprang for short breaks. It was the nearest town which was habitable although it took its share of damage. But all supplies and troops came up through Poperang. Here at Talbot House, two army chaplains started a rest and relaxation centre that was to be the beginning of the world organisation, TOC H.
The chaplains were the Reverend Tubby Clayton and the Reverend Neville Talbot, who named the house after his brother Gilbert Talbot, who was killed about six months earlier. Here we could relax and read, write letters. No matter the rank, we were all the same once inside the house. In the loft, they built a chapel, and it is left today just as it was, simple and humble. Tubby Clayton still comes and holds services here. Back in Ypres, I decided to find the War Graves Commission and ask them to help me find the grave of Sidney Nash. They were most helpful and said, as he had no known grave, he was therefore commemorated on the Menin Gate. The Menin Gate stands on the Menin Road and was built as a memorial to all those who died without a known grave in the Ypres Salient. There are 53,000 names from all parts of the Commonwealth. Each evening, two men of Ypres stand underneath the gate. The traffic is stopped and the last post is played. A very moving moment. After a long search, I at last found Sidney's name, just in the middle of a shaft of sunlight shining through the columns. Nash, S.J.